Welcome back to the RSA conference. We're here at uh, Broadcast Alley in Moscone West. Doug Merritt's here, CEO of Aviatrix, and he's joined by Chris McHenry, who's the Vice President of Product Management. Guys, welcome. We're going to talk about the, the, the cloud networking joining with SecOps. Love it. Welcome. It's a topic that we have a little bit of info on. Why now, <laughs> Doug, why now? Um, when you go back and look at networking over the past 50 years, I think if you'd sat down and really thought as a network architect, how should we design these networks, the core security constructs, things like firewalling and natting, would have been included in that, in, in everything that networking did. The way that networking evolved, you had to have a bunch of boxes out there that were purpose-built for their use cases, and so you had this security orientation as a separate set of boxes that were conceptually in the network topology but weren't natively integrated in. That SDN movement was supposed to cure all that, kind of had its boom and faded, um, and I think now with cloud, and cloud being as pervasive as it is, you've got a fully virtualized L1, H, L2 layer, right? All that core infrastructure that's so important is available. A company like Aviatrix can come in with a uh, complete network, a full network capability as one solution out there that natively includes network security and security constructs. It's not a whole separate thought process. Are you routing? Are you trying to load balance and app optimize? Are you trying to encrypt? Are you trying to invoke security? Like that should all just be part of the same dialogue. And I think as cloud continues to progress, and we get more heterogeneous with cloud. Now you're seeing purpose-built LLM clouds spring up. So we've always had the three big cloud vendors, but you know, Oracle knows its way into that dialogue as well as a bunch of the regional clouds, and I think we're just going to see more heterogeneity and more preponderance of these clouds. And the question I think keeps coming up of like, the constructs were not that effective and efficient as a bolt-on, what are we going to do to make it native and integrated with networking? It why shouldn't be a bolt-on. Why do you think SDN you know, petered out. It looked like VMware, you know, had an angle there for a while, um, and then it just sort of fell off the map. Why is that? Just it wasn't functional enough, or? I, I, I think it, it was a tough play. Um, the way these boxes evolved, you had nine, 10, 15 boxes as part of every rack from different vendors, right. and you had a bunch of people at that data center that had bet their careers on their F5 boxes, their Palo boxes, their Checkpoint boxes, their Cisco boxes, their Juniper boxes, and it was a beautiful value prop of, wait, 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 hey, we've progressed on the hardware front, there, why don't we have a software layer and a more general purpose hardware layer? But human, human dimension, human psychology is tough. You've got to go back in that data center and try and convince six different buyers Here's a better way of doing it. So I think it's, it's just, it, it's, it, was a, it was right technologically and philosophically, but just hard to execute, is my view, as a, you know, look, always easy to have a rear view mirror. Um, the interesting thing is with the cloud, why wasn't it done natively that way from the beginning? Because here you didn't have to rip and replace a bunch of other vendors. And for whatever reason, the cloud vendors emulated that old model. Right. So they've got all these awesome networking services, but you've got your firewalling service, you've got your routing service, you've got load balancing service, you've got NAT service. It's like, wait a second, you didn't have to do that. Um, and I'm grateful that Aviatrix took a different approach. Yeah, so too much entrenched, you know, Cisco and others, but Chris, explain why this approach is, is better and how you guys attack it. Yeah, well, <laughs> first off, I think the need is greater to some extent, right? Even if we go back and look at Kind of the, the, one of the big drivers for SDN, even day zero, when we look at NYSERA and NSX and a lot of the things that VMware was doing there, firewalling and security was always one of the big needs. Right. The difference being, we had a perimeter. We had something at the edge that was you know, a traditional firewall that was protecting us from the real danger zone, which is the internet. And one of the things that changes when you go to the cloud is that the internet is now everywhere. So to some extent, the need is actually greater as well. And I think that's, you know, when we, when we look at how we approach this slightly differently, actually we're, we're, we're thinking about different kinds of network security. Still looking at things like the zero, you know, zero trust paradigms, micro segmentation, uh, you know, those kinds of um, you know, tools and controls and, uh, that organizations need in order to, to improve their security posture. But we also want to be very intentional about how do we converge perimeter security into that, into that foundational security layer for the cloud. Because the internet is so much more ever present when applications are being deployed in the cloud. So it's a slightly different set of tools and capabilities. And then the last thing I'll say is, you know, 
we're not talking about greenfields. We're talking about going into right. application environments that are already pretty messy. And so the ability to integrate and automate and understand that landscape up front and really make it easy for organizations to insert security retroactively into a brownfield environment, a huge, huge, huge differentiator for us. That awareness of the cloud is really, you know, helps organizations achieve, achieve their objectives much more quickly. Yeah, so Doug, you, you explained the entrenchment and the problem that customers had to go through to, to, to merge security and, 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 and networking. What does a customer have to go through? What are the prerequisites to adopt your solution? Uh, there was a blog that we pushed out like a week ago, Embrace the Chaos, just building on, uh, on Chris's construct. Let the chaos rain uh, and then rain it in. I don't, I don't know how to not, <laughs> like it, it, chaos is, it is. Um, and, it, and I think it's just going to continue. Again, the heterogeneity within those cloud environments and the heterogeneity across the workload environment I think is going to continue. And with heterogeneity, you've got different constructs, which means you need something that's been purpose built to be easily deployed and integratable across those. Um, so one, one of the many advantages that's exciting about AV, Aviatrix is we've always taken an infrastructure as code approach and an integratable and heter, heterogeneous approach. So you can really start in that brownfield environment on any of 10, 20, 50 different use cases. And it's so much more important in the cloud to make sure that we, you know, security has a good relationship with the application development team because that was one of the drivers, that, 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 that partnership that I think security tended to have a, a bigger share of the power balance on premises uh, to the detriment of speed oftentimes. And cloud, one of the primary value propositions is speed. So you have to rethink how security integrates with the tooling that the app developers are using. Like we want to be able to provide security that both the InfoSec teams, the SecOps teams, and the app teams love. And so that, that, that infrastructure as code approach, the deep integration with the cloud, you know, doing things like identity-based zero trust where the, the, the developers don't have to request changes to their firewall policies. I mean, that whole mindset of serving both the app developers and the security teams really is, is a critically important part of it. So who are your peeps? Is it the SecOps team? Is it the networking team? Is it the DevOps team? All three? All three, but the yeah. core that we serve is the networking team. Yeah. Right? The, 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 val the base value comes with the fact that we are a legitimate data plane that is able to live uh, in a multitude of different clouds. So we touch packets, we filter packets, we, um, and the people that control that deployment have networking credentials somewhere in their, in their title, but then the value, once you get that in, massive value to the SecOps team, massive value to the DevOps team, turns out massive value to the FinOps team. There's a whole different cost uh, exposure that we create that can pretty dramatically reduce your cloud bills um, because the way that we process packets across the cloud that avoids a lot of egress and data processing fees. Um, so whether it's app dev, DevOps, IT ops, sec ops, as soon as you get our technology in, they all get massive value, but the core is really that networking team. Which by the way, shouldn't be surprising, right? right. So like, if I look at the fundamental thing that we did, I would say we took a lot of the concepts that you had on premises, and instead of lifting and shifting them to the cloud, we refactored and we re-architected them for the cloud. And if you go to any of the cloud providers, you know, best practices, you'll see benefits are, you know, better performance, lower total cost of ownership, all of the things agility, that come, yeah, agility, agility, all the things that come with refactoring, right? And pretty much everybody else just lifted and shifted their software. Right, which doesn't get you those, right, those benefits. Right, exactly. We were talking earlier about SASE and how you guys fit and some of the drawbacks, actually. I mean, SASE got a lot of momentum in the marketplace. Um, let's relive that conversation a little bit. So, what are you hearing from customers? You know, there's some goodness there, but there's some, some, some drawbacks. Explain that. So I'll start, but I'll let Chris clean up with all the intelligent comments, <laughs> but um, I, I, I like the embrace the chaos. It's an and, not an or. Right. Sassy is awesome. And the Sassy vendors serve a really important purpose. It's very different than what we do. They provided a framework 
that creates zero trust and a whole host of security benefits when you're looking at the, going back to uh, Chris talking about perimeterless, when you're talking about at, at the individual that could be anywhere, not inside the confines of a gated community, a campus, uh, anything that's controlled by that organization. The question is what happens as soon as that packet leaves that safe, walled community, and that, that's where we come in. Yeah, and if you think about like the architecture of applications and deperimeterization in general, that cloud layer, right? Let's say that I have a new application, I want to start using AIML as an example. Well, one of the big benefits of these cloud providers is they have all of these higher level application services. I can't afford to send traffic out of the cloud and bring it back in. Not, not only from a performance perspective, but literally from a cost perspective because they're going to charge you egress fees and, and data transfer in the cloud costs money. So we have to have a security layer in physically, like in the cloud that allows us to have that level of security, have that level of inspection, yet consume the applications that live in that exact same cloud region or that exact same cloud provider. And that's really where we live. I like to say that we serve service to service traffic. We do zero trust and security for services talking to other services. And SASE tends to focus on the users talking to services and both are incredibly important layers of a security architecture. So you sit next to that. Yeah, sort of we sit SASE next to it. System. I mean, the, the, we, we, many, many, many of our customers use SASE as the layer to protect their users and their user traffic and use you know, something like Aviatrix to protect their applications that live in the cloud. So you really extend the value proposition. Yeah, then, absolutely. Is that right? They're it's very, not, very complementary. You, you're not shortening the point to point necessarily, or is there a play there as well? I, there, I think there. there's there's absolutely a play there, yeah. right? I mean, again, it's about the efficiency. If I can keep that traffic in the same region of the same cloud and, and still apply security to it, we get better performance, we get lower cost from a data transfer perspective. So yeah, super super complementary. One other nuance here too is in the context of zero trust. The identity for applications is fundamentally different, right? So if I think about being able to apply zero trust policy, it, it, one of the critical hinges there is identity. It has to be dynamic, right? And apps in the cloud are super, super dynamic. So we've built our distributed cloud firewall product to be identity aware, but not necessarily users, apps, right? So that the application teams can destroy and, and, uh, and re-spin up applications, yet the policy is going to follow them. That zero trust policy is really optimized for the cloud environment. And that's irrespective of where that app lives. Uh, irrespective it doesn't matter location. which cloud. Exactly. Yeah, or, going back to, so many of our customers will have different components of, a, of an application spread across clouds, but then things happen and you wind up relocating something for whatever reason. Um, and it doesn't matter, none of that matters to us. Like we are that uh, abstraction layer that gives you a singular set of interfaces and control, ubiquitous control, anywhere within a multi-region footprint within a cloud or even a very complex multi-VPC or VNet uh, framework within a cloud, but then certainly between clouds. Now, I'm all the way out to Equinix and the edge or edge uh, connectivity at your own de data center that we can deploy into. What would be an example of that? I can imagine I've got, I mean, I think of Walmart, they got stuff on-prem, they got stuff in the Azure cloud, they obviously don't do AWS, but I can imagine a customer in AWS running some applications, but wants to run some analytics, or maybe now with Gen AI in Google. Um, is that a, a, a reasonable use case? How, how would Super you Super common that? use case, yeah. although yeah. I would say I don't know that Walmart is in AWS, but yes. No, no, yeah, they're, they're not. not. <laughs> no, they're not. Okay, yeah, cool. yeah, but, but, but they're in yeah. Google and but, Azure. But per, per, they have a triplet yeah. model, yeah. they're on-prem, with yep. like OpenStack or something. That, yes. You yep. know, and then they go to Azure, right. they go to Google. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and some, some of those applications are Kubernetes based, some of those applications are PaaS services, and, and yeah. that actually is you know, surprisingly common from an architectural perspective. Sure. We want to, again, in the context of embrace the, the chaos, right? We want to actually empower organizations to leverage the best services from whatever cloud is, is, is providing those things, right? And it could be different layers of the application stack, could be different teams in the organizations that have preferences for those different pieces, but the InfoSec team and the networking team needs a consistency layer so that they can actually enable and empower choice, right? And that, I think that's really one of the big things that we, that, we, uh, that we provide for, and we have a lot of customers who have those kinds of models. I mean, anchor, we call them anchor applications or gravity workloads, right? And every cloud provider is looking for gravity workloads so that they can pull through other applications, but if you have that, um, and that agnostic layer uh, that allows you to, to provide security independent of where it lives, then you can use the best from each of the independent clouds. And are these, are you um, 
trickling into mission critical workloads? Absolutely. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And uh, are you seeing more Oracle in yes, those spaces? Yes, a huge I mean, driver the, for Oracle Cloud. They're the, they're the granddaddy of mission critical workloads. I mean, yes. nobody beats Oracle when it comes to like recovery from you know, yeah. database problems or <laughs> applications. It's been, it's been really impressive the past three years. Yeah. Um, that you know, they, they stuck with it. And this latest iteration of Oracle Cloud is, is really interesting. And they're back in the game. And we're seeing more and more of our customers begin to be thoughtful about, hey, if I've got my Oracle financial applications or manufacturing apps, or I've got my Oracle databases, do I need to lift and shift those somewhere or should I be transitioning to Oracle native uh, in the cloud, which just increases that complexity. But I go back to, I think the only customers that don't fit what we were talking about would be a less than five year old company that is completely modern in their applications and was smart enough to say I'm just going to be in one cloud and I'm not going to grow big enough to get, I'm never going to do an M&A. Um, so there are some of those maybe. And then maybe some pretty antiquated companies are like I never left the mainframe. Like yeah. I've, got, I've got my walled garden and I never experimented. Everyone else, which I think is millions of customers, right, fit right in that middle. I mean, that's your TAM, is that yes. fat middle. I mean, exactly. that's, that's the whole market. What about, let's talk about AI. Well, 20 minutes in, we haven't talked about AI. So what, <laughs> what's your AI We're play? so countercultural and, right uh, I know, right? <laughs> and, uh, I mean, I know we've talked about it before, but it's, uh, how, does, how does it play in your world? So I think there are two major threads that we care about. Um, one is intent-based networking. It's still, you know, mm -hmm. to really do this properly, there's a lot of complexity. And how do we help teams, dev teams, as well as networking teams, declare what they want? Um, I'm trying to create an app with these characteristics, it's got to hit these different areas, including these databases, what should that network topology look like? Is one of the angles that we're, we're trying to drive down. Um, and the second is autonomous AI. That, it's, that, that first piece is how do I help the network engineer and the development teams do their work more effectively. I think what we'll see in the next 18 to 36 months is things are happening so quickly, especially with the threat landscape, that humans will be uh, in the loop to watch and make sure that things are happening properly, but we've got to have agents talking to agents to react at the speed that I believe we're going to need over the next 18 to 24 months. So, so. Uh, AI for networking and, and SecOps, mm -hmm. yep. you know, apps talking to apps, you know, not yep. necessarily humans, maybe humans in the loop if need be, um, so is that like roadmap stuff, or where does that fit? I mean, it's stuff that we're executing against right now. Yeah, okay. We're going stuff over the course of the next six months. Really, uh, how do we accelerate, um, how do we accel I, I think there's opportunity in accelerating zero trust as well, right? So there's a few areas that we're making investments in, but yeah, absolutely. Starting to integrate the product uh, with AI in a lot of different places to help improve usability, accelerate, uh, better security posture, all of those kinds of things. And we're, we're lucky enough because we took the time to build this cloud native router that operates across these different clouds, which again means we get packet level information. We're lucky enough to get data that nobody else can get. When you look at the services from the cloud vendors, they're, they're, they're good, but they're trying to keep the end user at the right layer of depth. Because if you get too deep, and it's a service, then things can go sideways and they don't want downtime and non-resiliency. Non so we can provide a much deeper layer of insight to traffic across these clouds than you can even get from the CSPs themselves. Uh, Chris and team just released uh, our network API. One of our values early on was, hey, we're going to gather all that data and try and drive everyone to our pane of glass. A big shift that Chris and team had the past nine months is, yeah, I mean, we'd love you to use our pane of glass called Copilot, but why don't we spread that data out? It's a heterogeneous world, and so let's make sure that app observability vendors, let's say, we announced that with the network API, we announced integration with New Relic, but we're working with Datadog and Dynatrace and the rest of the crew so that they can get those network insights that plague the app teams that just can't see, like whose fault is it, how do we actually correct this, but whether it's other network observability vendors, like happy to pa pass those packets, open API, pass those packets to the network layer, anyone that's trying to gather that data, you know, our job is to, is to really help them with that insight, but that is a long story to say, we've got some really cool data. When you're thinking about AI, and we're trying to do with AI, yep. um, we're, we're privileged to have some really interesting insights that are uh, almost impossible to come by unless, unless you're AVH. And another good example of that is, in addition to the Network Insights API, we announced uh, several months ago, about a month and a half ago, that we are an early partner with Microsoft on security, for or Copilot for security. So you'll see their development work of that over the next six months, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's not just the observability for network performance monitoring, it's also how do we integrate 
with observability in the security stack as well, so that, again, when I think about those different stakeholders, I want, I want the security team to operate better when Aviatrix is in place, I want the app teams to be happier when Aviatrix is in place, I want the networking teams to be obviously the happiest when Aviatrix <laughs> yeah. is in place, but, but it's, about serving, <laughs> it's about taking the, the, the unique place that we are in the data plane and serving each of those different contingencies. I was going to ask you guys about your ecosystem, ecosystem strategy, where you get in traction, so I'm hearing the observability guys, and then Microsoft, maybe you could summarize kind of your partner strategy. Yeah, there are three really, really strong contingencies. Um, the cloud service providers themselves, Microsoft, AWS, GCP, et cetera. Um, yeah, we only live because they're there. Uh, it, there's been different thoughts across Aviatrix on are they competitive or not, and so we've, oh, it's always going to be a competition. It's so, a gift yeah, that they've we, given we the world. No, Absolutely. Let's take advantage of it, right? Um, so they're a really, really important mm. partner, and we're really trying to ramp up those partnerships. As Chris was talking about, getting involved in that co-pilot initiative was really important to us, but um, our our engineering teams and their engineering teams and product managers are meeting to make sure that we're cooperating. Uh, second is the ISV framework that we talked about. How do we integrate with uh, New Relics and Datadogs and other network providers and uh, we're obviously very, very deep in uh, Terraform uh, and what Hashi provides, so the technology landscape is really important to us. Uh, and then the third is the classic VAR and systems integrator world of, yeah, there's a shortage of really effective networking skills out there. Um, everyone's fighting for them. Uh, and so making sure that we've got deep partnerships there so that everything from network des design and topology all the way through to helping run networks and, and select the right vendors um, we're involved with. Uh, we covered the Hashi uh, IBM announcement. You know, we spent some time on theCUBE, our analysts you know, wrote it up. IBM really doesn't, they're really not a networking company per se, you know, so I, I don't know if that's a possible partnership, but you guys definitely should be talking to them, of course, with the, yeah, we have. With the Hashi relationship. Yep. I mean, I feel like IBM's you know, got sort of a new momentum kind of a new, new focus, new culture, so there's another one. Not really so much of a you know, cloud play like Oracle might be, but boy, well, they're everywhere. Similar though, in, in the fact that a lot of those gravity workloads may be running on AIX or, or mainframes, right? Yeah, so that's true. I, I think conceptually, we're going to see a lot of specialty clouds. Some of that's going to be AI driven, some of that's going to be legacy workload driven, but the end state is going to be more diversity for organizations, which means that standardization layer is so much more important. And the whole sovereign cloud thing. Exactly. Yes. You see yes. a lot of that now. Yep. Yes. Um, I mean, everybody wants to have their data in their country, and that's, that's, a, that's a trend that's, yeah. that's not going to just turn around overnight. Right. Embrace the chaos, <laughs> <Yeah>. embrace the <laughs> chaos. <laughs> RSA is kind of new for you guys. So, what's your take on the show? What are you doing here? Uh, first time at RSA, uh, because you know, our core buyer is that network engineering and network ops team. Right. Um, but there's so much security benefit to what we do. Um, so we're really, we got some good flow at the booth, yeah. um, but we're really here, I, I believe, my intent was to learn is, what is the right messaging for cyber teams and CSOs? How do we help bridge that gap between the really, really hard job that the security teams have with that equally really hard job that network engineering and network ops teams have um, so we can make them better allies and uh, much more well aligned and uh, it's, I'm, I'm excited to be here. It's obviously with my Splunk past, this was one of the most important shows yeah, the entire year indeed. and it'd be nice to yeah. make, I, th I think we can make that happen over time um, here with uh, Aviatrix. Good deal. And, and fundamentally, we see that networking and network security are converging. Yeah, and that's a trend that's thing. been happening over the last you know, 13, 14 years, software-defined networking, we talked at the beginning, was one of the big drivers behind that. We announced our distributed cloud firewall product last year, right before RSA, and so uh, we've been starting to make a, a, a splash, and we've got a lot of customers who are using it to help improve and, and accelerate their zero trust programs. And, uh, and so I, I see that trend continuing, and, and, and the network will become, you know, security has always been a complexity driver in networking. It, it gets complex when you need to put a firewall in there, or you need to do encryption, or you know, it's, it's one of those complexity drivers, and so a lot of what we do is oftentimes driven by security and compliance requirements, whether it's a networking specific use case or whether it's a firewalling use case. Yeah, and there's a lot of talk now about the securing the AI. People are mm -hmm. really concerned about that. There are a lot of startups really focused on that from, from the silicon, confidential computing, all the way up through the apps. So that's just more chaos. Yes, <laughs> more, yeah, chaos. more chaos. Guys, thanks so much for coming to theCUBE. Always such a pleasure having you. Thank you. Always yeah, love being likewise. here. Thank you for having us on. It's, it's chaos here. Just bring on the content. We'll bring it back to you. <clears throat> we'll be right back, right after this short break. You're watching theCUBE from RSA 2024.